while this is pulling up, I do appreciate the invitation and uh, basically on behalf of Barbara Bellissima, who is our senior vice president here in Canada, and I do believe she is a member of your board of directors. Um, this is actually an opportunity for us to kind of just talk about some of the learnings that uh, we see in the Friends to the South, if you will, uh, but also kind of parallel some of the conversations with some of the experiences that we see here in Canada. Um, what I'd like to do is just kind of set a little context for you first to give you a little bit of perspective as to how we, at least in State Farm, take a look at the importance of, of personal awareness as well as personal responsibility from our customers' perspectives to prevent and to mitigate some of the losses that you see with some of the wildfires. Uh, as we go through this discussion, obviously if you have questions, I'd take them on at any time you spark the question or as well as at the end. Um, some of this information hopefully will put into perspective how the size of, of, of a few things often create challenges that you heard from both Mike and Peter around uh, funding, around the appropriate level of attention put on particular risks. Um, it's, it's a widespread issue across the United States as well as in Canada and oftentimes competing initiatives that are both within in the industry or within just the economic area that, that we're working uh, create unique challenges that often preclude us from being able to put appropriate attention to some of the, the risks that we have. So I'm going to build a little bit of context, talk a little bit about State Farm so that you have a little bit deeper understanding of who we are and where we play within the market. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the catastrophic wildfires here in Canada and in the United States and Peter did a really nice job. Uh, I'm very glad that he did a nice job talking about the Canadian exposure because I elected to leave some of that out with the presumption that we know all about that. But I will translate a little bit of that into some of the United States, at least the 2011 catastrophes that we saw relative to Texas because that's the most living experience that we can talk from some of the learnings that we have and then talk through a few of the, the strategic risk opportunities that we have within the industry uh, around pre-event response and then post-event strategies relative to large catastrophic fires. I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the pre-event because that really builds more around what we can do to create awareness, educate, mitigate, and prevent the events rather than respond to them or actually take a look afterwards, but we'll, we'll touch on a few high points there. Um, just for State Farm to kind of put into perspective for you, as an enterprise, we're the largest PNC insurance carrier in the United States. We're about the eighth largest here in Canada, uh, fourth largest, I believe, in auto. Um, but you can kind of see in the United States, we carry a large market penetration, market share relative to homeowners and commercial risks that are most problematic when you start thinking about fire exposure. Around 24 million households within the enterprise, and that does include Canada. Here in Canada, we have about 1.2 million households that we serve. Um, the reason why I talk about this both from an enterprise and from a Canadian perspective is the last couple of bullets that you'll see, the number of employees and the number of agents that we have across North America. So much of what we hope and so much of how we prepare is built on a term of grassroots in, in, in the sense of uh, the folks that are in the lo local areas, whether it be in states or provinces, municipalities, towns, townships, or wherever it is, they really are our first line defense. And when we start to talk about awareness a little bit later, we do look upon our local representatives to not only provide the peer-to-peer -peer discussions with their neighbors, uh, as well as some of the response side. So it's an important facet for us because so much of what we do is driven by the employee base as well as the agency base that we have. State Farm in general is broken up into 13 regions or 13 zones. Uh, you can see them depicted on the map. In Canada itself is one zone, uh, but the ones that have the biggest wildfire exposure are typically the southwest and western parts of the United States. And so we do have uh, areas of timber in the pack northwest that create some unique challenges for us as well as we have some volcanic activity up in the area that oftentimes creates um, the possibilities of large fires. But most of the time when you watch the news in the United States, you'll see it coming from California, Colorado, New Mexico, or Texas. Those generally are the areas where we have the hugest wildfire exposure. 
in Canada, obviously, when we get out west, um, and I think the 2003, or yeah, the 2003 cat catastrophes that you had out there uh, with some of the fire pieces, as well as the Ontario piece in 2011, you can see that we're well represented across the board. Um, in Canada, we have three areas that we market. And obviously, Alberta, Ontario, and New Brunswick are depicted on the map. Um, we show that we have permanent claim offices in each of those market areas. And, and quite frankly, the employees and the agents that service those areas are housed and domiciled within the market areas that they serve. And they serve for us as primary, that first line of entry as we start talking about uh, some of the awareness and mitigation aspects as we start looking at any kind of catastrophic risk along the, along the board. Uh, the part that I'm responsible for is um, basically the enterprise ca catastrophic response vehicle that we have. Um, we have the largest catastrophe response in the industry. Um, we have roughly 1,750 permanent catastrophe staff members that do nothing but work on catastrophic events throughout the year. Most of them are away from home, roughly 220 to 250 days a year, uh, working tornadoes, hurricanes, fires, and the like. We do have three centralized operations that will service all of the U.S. as well as Canada virtually. And so with technology today, about 60% of the work that we do on catastrophic ends are done in those three locations. And uh, which, if you would imagine a call center environment, um, we have a rather large, it can be ramped up to anywhere between 1,500 to 2,200 people serving in those three areas. Uh, we have strategic contracts with independent firms here in Canada as well as the United States, which provide us another insulated factor of about 2,900 to 3,500 qualified, experienced claim handlers when the call needs, and quite frankly, we, we typically use them all, all year long. Uh, and then finally, we have a fleet of specialized vehicles that allow us the opportunity to create an environment where we bring in a claims office to the area of damage. And so as we're thinking, most recent in Ball Strip down in Texas, our large catastrophe vehicles were on site within 48 hours to where our customers were able to geographically find us with the red and white flags and were able to start passing out the money and, and giving them some sodas and, and water and the like. But that's the area that I'm responsible for. Now, as you look at the numbers, and hopefully this will put in perspective, and this is a challenge for, for those of you that are in the, in the business of, of wildfires, because across the spectrum, you'll see that it isn't a huge component of risk when, relative to the number of claims that we do receive. The number of homeowners claims that we handle in the enterprise on a yearly basis, and this is fire predominantly, is about 1.3. Those that are handled by my group in the catastrophe area, about 700,000 on a 10-year average. And so last year we had a 1.4 million claims. Uh, it was a bad year <laughs> in the States, really bad year. Uh, in fact, it was the worst year in the last 15, both financially and as far as number of claims. In Canada, you can see that on average, they, they're roughly around 25,000 claims, fire and homeowners claims. And about two to 3,000 of those are typically what we term to be in a catastrophic event. And for us, a catastrophic event would be easily defined as an area where you have more than 50 to 100 to 150 losses that exceed the, the local area's ability to handle those claims, then we try to come in and help along the line. The, the alarming part, especially if you're in the fire, the wildfire community, is that, you know, the percent of claims handled with a wildfire cause of loss are very, very small. And um, we don't, compare, say, compared to a tornado, um, when you get comparing those type of issues, especially down in the States, it's a relatively small number of claims that we actually receive out of wildfires. However, the severity of those individual claims tends to be much greater than what you see across the board in most of the other events. Um, you know, our cause of loss payments in, in Joplin, Missouri, for example, where we, had, we our, ourselves had 1,000 total losses uh, that we had to service out of those tornadoes, um, was much less than what we saw in the fires in Ball Strip on a per claim basis. Just because concentrated damages, you have fewer claims, but those claims are typically pretty much grounders and you're paying out the, the total amount. So you can see how this works. Um, just a few high end numbers just kind of set us at the, the stage that we go. And so Peter and Mike both kind of talked through the Canadian exposures. We focus more on the 2011 pieces because it's 
it's most common in our minds and, and really we're talking current dollars. And so when you go back to 2003 or even in our examples, when you go back to Oakland in 1991, you know, th those dollars are $91 and so it's a little bit difficult because of expense and technology and things today are a little bit uh, more advanced. Um, but just if you look back in the, at 2011, uh, Peter did a nice job putting up there a lot of the, the issues that you saw in Ontario, a lot of the, the financial impacts that you felt as well as a lot of the personal impacts that were felt by the homes and the families that uh, had to evacuate as well as suffered through some of the total losses that they saw. The interesting part was the 8,000 wildfires occurring in each year and I think Mike talked about that early on in his present slide. When you take a look at the United States, we average on a 10-year basis about 73,000 wildfires a year. And so that's out of the USG, uh, that's their estimate of, of how many, and, and when I started looking at this I tried to figure out, is it, is it because we define things differently? Um, but as you break it down across the United States, the frequency of wildfires, uh, especially in the southern and southwest, it, it's constantly occurring where you have two or three of those things going a period of time. Fortunately for us in the last few years they haven't gotten to the point of out of control that we really saw in the early 90s where we had um, not only the Oakland area but up into 93 with Malibu and Laguna where we had th literally thousands and thousands of homes totally destroyed as a result of the spread of the wildfire. I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about Texas for you today just because it is most recent in our mind and we probably have the most um, advanced approach to handling some of the things. Uh, California and PAC Northwest probably have the most aggressive, very similar to your approaches here around um, both awareness, education, mitigation, and prevention. But Texas is starting to grow in the sense that there aren't a lot of trees in Texas and there's not a lot to stop a fire. So once it starts and the wind goes, um, those planes burn up very quickly and they move, move very rapidly across the landscape. Um, and I think one of the questions was how far out do you start getting a little bit alarmed. In Texas, um, they see a, a smattering of smoke out west, they're getting alarmed in Houston because <laughs> by the time the end of the day it could probably make its way across there with some of the winds that it have. But if you look at Texas just in general, and Texas is a rather large state, but they had about almost four million acres were burned in 2011. Um, but even with that, there were only about a thousand insured losses that, that were suffered throughout the, and when we talk about this since these are some of the more serious pieces, uh, $109 million in indemnity paid during that period of time. But Bostrup, Bostrup was probably the area that had the most significant concentrated damage and one that made the news. And so the Weather Channel, if you happen to ever watch the Weather Channel or any of the national news, you got that picture of that one farm from about five different vantage points and made it look like it was across the entire southern stretch of Texas. Um, but it, in reality, it was very concentrated. It was very, very focused in its approach. But at the end of the day, they had about 34,000 acres that were torched and burned. And within that, we had over 400 insured losses. And our indemnity was roughly around 73 to 100 million. And it'll continue to grow as we continue to work with the contents and continue to work with some of the ALE issues as they're trying to build up the properties. Um, the more important part, and we heard the question of an emotional pull. You know, one of the things in my world when we, we work every hurricane, every tornado, and every fire loss that occurs that is catastrophic in nature, um, you know, all being all, all, all very devastating, they're not nearly as personal as a fire. And one of the pieces that we find as we debrief and we work with our customers, the, the fire loss is a personal attack on individuals. You can actually see your home going up in smoke. Whereas in a hurricane, you're kind of fleeing and you don't know what it is until you go back. And quite frankly, a tornado, you're just hanging on and hoping it doesn't hit you. But when, when all things are said and done, a fire loss is a very personal, very personal effect on the individuals and, and because the remnants are so, so devastating as you're there. And, and we do look at counseling, we do look at issues around how do we help not only the customers respond, but it's a very personal event for our staff as they go into these because it's a devastating area. And for some reason, you know, I've stood in the middle of Joplin, Missouri, where it was 360 degrees, you could see nothing but debris. But if you stand in a neighborhood that's burned to the ground, you just feel worse about it. And so there's a huge emotional drain with fire. So I do believe that's something, as you think through some of the metagame factors, that's an area that we need to focus on. Community impact we found in Texas, 
There was serious infrastructural damage to areas around. The roads were destroyed and damaged. Some of them had to rebuild and repay because of the extreme heat as it went, uh, the, the, the brush went across. Um, utility lines, oil gas lines, uh, natural gas pipelines. There was a lot of disruption in utilities across the, the lower part of the state. Fire suppression equipment um, wore out and burned up and, and quite frankly um, couldn't keep up with a lot of the, 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 the spread of the fire and so that created unique challenges, especially in a state as big as Texas where it took an awful long time to get additional support from adjoining neighborhoods and communities as it went through. Uh, firefighters and community volunteers were pretty well worn by the end of the day. Uh, it was a, about a two week long process, constant bombardment with news and media as well as just the pressures that they felt. We saw a tremendous emotional toll. And then we did record some revenue impacts to local communities. Shopping basically stopped for a matter of days and anything they were buying was uh, fire suppression capabilities. They were looking um, at, at ways to put out fires if their home caught on fire. So Texas created a unique piece for us. We were able to step back and work with the Texas Zone to kind of figure out what are those things that can position us in the industry to help our con consumers and, and, and quite frankly the communities be a little bit better prepared. Um, so we've kind of broken this down into some, some different pre-event strategy pieces. I'm going to talk a little bit about creating awareness talk a little bit about prevention and a little bit about mitigation and some of the things that State Farm is doing to try to help and position ourselves to address the risk as we go through. Obviously on the creating awareness side of the business, it is really about education. It's trying to get our customers and communities a little bit more knowledgeable about the risks that they face and then allowing and helping them to mitigate those risks with some stronger approach, some organized approach to it and obviously fire smart. Firewise, uh, California has a ready, set, go. There are a lot of things that we, that we try to support and push through the local communities to help them position and develop their response and mitigation plans for, for um, the, the fire exposure. Use of social media, this is a phenomenon that's taken a new life in the last couple of years. Um, this is something that we've stepped into that really has uh, created an opportunity to reach an all a, a wider array, uh, array of customers. Um, we're trying to get, capture the youth a little bit differently so that they continue to start early when they buy their first homes so that they start thinking about you know what plants, what trees, how far do I put back on the, the shrubs and bushes and things along that line. And then finally in the awareness area we do push a lot of community outreach and I kind of talked a little bit about the importance of our uh, presence of our agents and our staff that are in the local areas. We rely on them quite heavily to try to educate and help the public around catastrophic events to help mitigate those exposures. On the prevention side, we do support land use covenants um, with the expansion and the migration into the urban areas, out of urban markets and into um, more of the scenery areas, if you will. Um, you know, you can, you can go to Malibu and you can stand in Malibu and you can ask folks now, why is it you built where you built? Uh, and, and it's beautiful. It really is a gorgeous area to live. And it's wonderful to have the, the nature right up, you know, button up to your property until the sparks start. <laughs> and then it just takes off. And, and so it's, it's about making folks wise. And we do support the use of covenants and building, <coughs> building restrictions in master plan communities to be a little bit smarter to have setbacks, to do the things around construction. Uh, there was a period of time in the central United States where wood roofs were all the rage. Um, well, some subdivisions required roof root, wood shingles or wood shake roofs. Well, quite frankly, after about 10 years, they're just a number waiting to burn. And if you have any kind of conflagration at all, the fire will spread roof to roof very rapidly. And so it's educating folks around the fact that composition roofs around um, don't necessarily have that same fire hazard and so we try to educate along that line. Uh, we do encourage defendable space development, trying to create an environment where more developers are better educated around how to put together master plan communities, how to create f natural fire blocks and firewalls so that it does at least mitigate the approach and, and the progression of the fire. So it gives the firefighters and the suppression capabilities a chance to get ahead of it. Um, some of the things that we saw in Texas was being very flat and um, the fact there wasn't very, there was very little planning in that nature 
once it started, there was nothing that was going to stop it except for the weather. Uh, there, it, just, it just kept going and going and going. I think you probably see that in some of the forestry areas as well. And then we do push community wildfire protection plans. A, a comprehensive and um, strategic approach to balancing the push into the wildfire areas and to, to some of the woodland areas um, so that the communities better understand the risks that they create as they continue to, to add zoning areas and build in, in particular market areas. So on the mitigation standpoint, talk a little bit about supporting building codes. You know, fire protection construction is a new, it's not actually new, but it's an area that we're also talking through in, in standardized building codes. Uh, when you look south and you think about the United States, the biggest push for standardized building codes is usually around earthquakes and hurricanes. Well, we're talking an awful lot about um, fire retardant type products as well because we're you know, trying to prevent um, fire losses as well. Excuse me, as well. And so do we mandate in-house sprinkler systems? And the community that I live in actually passed a law in Bloomington, Illinois, uh, where any new construction after 2011, 2012 has to have um, fire suppression capabilities within the home. And so uh, I think you're starting to see that in some of the communities we need to support that. The, f the firefighting infrastructure, you heard a lot about the suppression expense. Obviously, you're going to get into budget constraints with that, and we try to support not only that through grants and processes, but also through our uh, grassroots efforts of our employees. We encourage them to be volunteer firemen. We encourage them to participate in the volunteer fire departments and educate as they go through from that standpoint. And then finally, just a little bit around partnerships, and that's more in the sense of response now when you start thinking about the American Red Cross and some of the Canadian Red Cross. So let's talk a little bit about awareness. And one of the programs that we're most proud of that really has seemed to work in those strategically defined market areas that have large wildfire capabilities and, and the loss prevention education program. And really it's an effort to increase the policyholders' awareness of the risks that they incur as they live in particular market areas that are susceptible to wildfires. Um, we actually identify and target the homes that we want to go visit. And those are generally based off of a wildfire risk assessment that we, can, that we create. Uh, we do use some advanced technology as well as third-party technology to help us with some of the vegeta vegetation characteristics and the topography of the land so that we can identify where do we have the greatest risks. Obviously, um, this is a, um, it has to be a targeted approach in the sense that we just don't have that many resources to be able to go to do this and you saw the exposure we really don't have relative to the ex compared to the expense so it is a targeted piece it's elected by the zones to be able to participate in this we do use our underwriting and our claims data and we probably have the, the largest extent of data relative to losses uh, in the industry and we pull that data mine the data to try to give us some uh, the propensity to be able to project out where we where we can expect fires, what are the type of homes and construction that would that are more susceptible to fires, and we add that all into target uh, the actual pull. The insurance inspectors that we pull are those that are trained by uh, state forestry agencies, so they have a little bit more knowledge than you or I going out uh, and saying, yeah, that that bush over there looks like it's a fire hazard. They're actually able to to help the insured and understand that. Um, their, their home isn't susceptible to risk. Uh, by the end of 2011, we'd say that we'd surveyed close to 68,000 68, homes. Now you're saying 2003, 2011, you only looked at 68,000 homes. Well, this is a targeted approach to wildfires now. When an insured home is being written and underwritten by the agent, there is a visual on site, and so, so much of the work is on the front end of the mitigation of understanding the risk and writing the risk appropriately. The interesting piece out of this nugget is that of those 68,000 homes, only about 1% of the homes were non-renewed for failure to respond to the recommendations to improve the fire retardants of the home. And so we do make recommendations to the insureds around here's what you need to do to protect your home, here's what you need to do to protect your community, and then we expect them to go ahead and process and go through that. Some of them, 1% of them, is um, when they refuse to do it, we actually cancel or non-renew and so that we're trying to mitigate the risk from the company standpoint. Um, talked a wee bit about some of the social media aspects. Um, this is some, some 
examples of what we've done to try to get a wider array of communication standards out to a wider variety of customers. And we do use the internet quite extensively. We have some specific areas on the internet that deal with wildfire exposure and risk management. Um, we provide the similar checklists that are provided to customers throughout both North America and South America and Australia around how to mitigate losses. What are the things that you can do to protect your home from being a risk? And so those are all available. But we've gotten a little bit more interactive so that you'll take a look at the lower left. We actually work with um, several agencies, both state and federal, to try to identify the overall risk. And we have an inter interactive wildlife wildfire map that shows what states have the most fires, where's the most area burned, and hopefully this will advise and, and help the customers better appreciate and understand where they sit relative to the exposure and risk management. Earlier on in my presentation, I said our focus is really trying to drive a lot of the responsibility back to the customers. Uh, we continue to hope that we, by educating the customers, making the tools available to them, they'll be in a better position to mitigate and to eliminate the risk, i.e. then helping the entire community as it builds. Um, mentioned a little bit about social media. We actually are playing on YouTube and following a fire in Colorado. Our public affairs department went out and did a really nice job of capturing a lot of shock risk photos, if you will. And they publish that and, and push that out and it can be accessed through the website. And oftentimes when people see the devastation that fire occurs to families, fire occurs to communities, it brings home a little bit more reality that that's what it will be like if you, if you don't take it seriously. And so this type of a program is pushed to those market areas that have larger risks for wildfires so that the awareness of the post event is a little bit easier to follow and a little bit easier to access than thinking about what it would be like because um, we're able to actually have some pictures of some things that go on. And then obviously, we do have a very targeted public affairs approach with press releases, especially when you get into the wildfire season, um, whether it's El Nino or, or whether it's just a very dry, hot, windy summer day. Um, the zones have the availability of the material. It's all pre-approved, it's all programmed, it's paid for. All they have to do is put it out on their spots with their local pre pre-existing relationships with the radios and TVs to put alert out in the public, public area. Um, and so that's kind of where we set with some of the awareness and education pieces, at least highlight some of the better ones that we feel are most effective. Um, from a prevention standpoint, we look at prevention in two aspects. How can you prevent the loss? And then the other aspect is how do you mitigate the extent of the loss? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the aspects that State Farm pushes relative to prevention. We do provide grants to various organizations that support wildlife uh, or wildfire prevention and preparedness. And then again, we do encourage the use of state, local, and federal agency resources. Um, for mitigating wildfire risk. And so a lot of this is done locally by the zones, but also at a national level, um, whether it be through our foundation that provides grants to local law enforcement and fire suppression teams, or whether it's the foundation or even zone resources that provide grants, uh, scholarships, and um, other financial incentives to some of the local communities that have the widest exposure, widest risk relative to wildfire. Um, part of it, <coughs> is the, the partnership and maintaining a relationship. One of the, the aspects I heard earlier is, you know, as you look at things, people tend to forget three, six months after a fire occurred and they really don't want to be bothered with it. One of our findings is that the, a sustained approach, a very structured approach often lends itself better credibility with customers if it's consistently applied period to period. And so your fire smart, fire wise down in the United States, the Institute, there are other agencies that we partner with to try to create these structured, success, successful, and continuum approaches to um, preventing wildfires on a mitigation and, 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 and um, prevention standpoint. And then we have adopted and really started to drive the 2009 International Wild Land Urban Interface Code as kind of the basis for our consideration set around how we're going to look at risks moving forward. And we de it, because we're jurisdictionally um, regulated, whether it's in the states or whether in, up here in, in Canada, and so there is some variation in the percentage of what we can and can't do in particular market areas, 
But our baseline is trying to approach it from that perspective to say these are the things that we know are consistent that we should be relying to, relying upon and trying to drive as we go through um, the entire piece. On the mitigation standpoint, um, try, trying to look at the, the overall maximum exposure that can occur in a wildfire piece and underwriting where appropriate, we use models uh, to develop some of the pricing for our homeowners products. And there are some jurisdictions that don't allow us to use the particular models that we do, but there are some that would, that would allow, because the awareness by the legislature, the awareness by the regulatory bodies as well as the communities, is that wildfires are a continued risk, so i.e. California, some of the western states. Our wildfire risk assessment is, a, is appropriately apportioned when, when applicable to the actual price that our consumers pay for the product that we offer in that particular market area. Um, we do use third-party data to help us with analyzing the risk. Um, these individual locations are based on type of the vegetation, the topography of the ground, the soil, uh, how well natural fire breaks are in place. Are you channeled within a, a particular arroyo or do we have particular wind patterns that uh, over a period of time continue to put greater risk in particular market areas. And a lot of this is California based in the sense of when fires hit the valleys, it's kind of a natural funnel of wind that, that just kind of builds the conflagration across and spreads it a lot more quickly. Uh, some of the most recent grants um, have kind of followed out of the Texas and Colorado fires of 2011, but we do provide grants to, to um, fire agencies to provide protective gear for the firefighters. Um, you know, in a lot of the volunteer fire departments, a lot of the rural fire departments, they just don't have the financial funds to be able to, to, to purchase the protective gear that they need for large hot fires. And so we do p provide grants for that. Uh, we provide grants, public education and fire prevention. Um, we support fire campaigns across the nation when they're provided, especially at a local level where our local executives work very closely with local communities to try to work through some of the the awareness and technologies that are there. Fun wildfire training academies and other wildfire training scholarships. And so a lot of it is at a grassroots level. Um, unfortunately, you know, if you look either in, in Canada or even in the United States, approaching it at a very national level oftentimes creates greater hardship or difficulty than if it were at a local level. And so we do work often with the local communities much more aggressively. And it's driven by our agents and, empl and employees who live in that market area who are often sitting on town councils, who are often elected officials that bring the risk and, and uh, try to work through the, the foundation or other um, processes to get grants and, and support as they go. Um, the partnership side of the business, uh, I would say partnerships is kind of loosely defined. It can be as equal, as, as small as just having uh, uh, one of our employees serving as a fire chief in a, in a local fire department and working through that and, and working very closely on a granular level as well as uh, at a national level where we talk a lot, an awful lot about the Red Cross, American Red Cross, as well as the Canadian Red Cross. The financial support that we provide to both those agencies as well as the partnership in sharing information and data and best learnings um, it seems to help us predominantly after an event occurs because they are often the first people on site, but also it helps on the prevention side because a lot of their campaigns are around prevention and mitigation of large issues that, that create a need for them. And so we try to fund and we try to work with them as best we can to give them the support so that they can push things out more nationally on a national basis. Um, part of the other aspect is the post-event activities we do with both firms and, and um, we haven't had the need in the Canadian market to really work after a large event but in in the United States when we follow up for example Hurricane Irene we work very closely with the Red Cross trying to get an idea of the data that they collect from their vantage points and that helps us then plan and mitigate issues moving forward. Um, right now we're, we follow their Twitter feeds um, as staff that kind of watch their Twitter feeds because quite frankly they have a, a much more robust tweeting 
economy and, and environment than we do. And oftentimes we're able to get a heads up on where particular hotspots are, are generated and then it helps us balance our overall response as we go. And then you can see that we provide millions of dollars in annual gifts to both ARC as well as the Canadian Red Cross. And in fact, in 2011, you can see that we, we donated to the New Brunswick flooding aspect through the Canadian Red Cross as we go. So from a partnership standpoint, it's um, our entire focus as a mutual company is always on the, the mutual owners, which is our customers, and we try to, to empower them to manage their relationships, but we're there to support through our partnerships those focuses so that our customers are in a better position to respond to overall catastrophic events. Um, talk a little bit about responding now, if you don't mind. And I know that the focus of this is on prevention and preparation. Uh, in the world that I play, we often see that our response is a good asset to helping prevent. And um, when you think about touching the lives of over a million customers last year that suffered from catastrophic events, part of that relationship that we forge with those customers is to help them understand what are the things that occurred and how can they help prevent those things. Because ultimately, in the end of the day, they're the ones that are paying the insurance premiums. And if they can mitigate the loss on the front end, oftentimes those premiums will balance themselves to where they won't continually see some of the increases. Mm -hmm. But the way that we respond um, is kind of a varied degrees of approach, and it's all on an appropriate basis. Um, to give you an example, when the tornadoes in to, uh, Joplin, Missouri hit, um, uh, a lot of people thought that we would have had hundreds and hundreds of people rolling into Joplin to service the community. Actually, we only had about 35. Because technology today, there's so much that can be done with a lack of a presence that uh, it, it, it positioned us to be able to move through the losses rather rapidly, as well as made contact and immediately with a lot of the customers that we saw. So, so much of this falls on the locals. So much of this falls on the regional and zone employees that are here. And so, for example, if an event is to occur in, in Canada, we rely very heavily on our REACT partners, uh, which is really the emergency response of the local folks that, that step in for the first 72 to 96 hours, they're the ones that are on site. And so Terry and his staff would be the ones that really step in and, and cover that right up front until we can kind of rally the troops and get enough resources here to kind of support and sustain the overall operation. Our agency force in, in Canada, it's greater than 500 agents. Um, they really are the ones that are trusted by our customers, and they're the ones our customers talk to first. So our focus is trying to get them heavily involved early on in the catastrophe because that's who the customer is going to call, and, and they, they tend to trust them a little bit more than the company man, if you will. And so our agents are an integral part in our response as we move through the whole process. Our field component, both from a claim representative or claim professional, as well as our public affairs, and this is where we start the grassroots activity that helps on the mitigation of future events as they advertise, as they start putting out where to go and what, what the issues are that are, people are facing. and, and um, it really helps paint a position of, of how we can prevent these type of events moving forward as well. Our centralized operations, which are the back office and backbone of the operation, we use current technology. We have an outbound dialer system that in the event of a progressing wildfire, every customer within the path or within the radius of the path of the fire is contacted automatically by an outbound dialer with, with both um, <laughs> warning indications as well as mitigation tips that they can consider as they watch the smoke traveling this way. After the event passes through, we also use the outbound dialer to check in on them and make sure that they have the right contact number so they can expediently report their claim. Aerial pictometry has advanced itself to a level today, um, but we have pretty much pre-property photos of 80% of the United States and about 40% of Canada. Um, so when houses burned to the ground, you saw the, the photo that Mike showed very early on um, where the 300 some odd homes had burned. We have a pretty good picture of what they look like before the fire. And so oftentimes we're able to come in and stick build estimates off of the 3D images that we get out of the pictometry that allows us to work with the customers much more quickly and get money in their hands so that they can start the repair process, which in turn helps stimulate the economy as the funds start to flow. And then finally, really, we rely heavily on call centers, um, trying to get those call centers uh, much, much more personal to where it's one contact, one customer, 
and then an easy pivot and warm transfer to the appropriate party to respond to their needs. So it's trying to create an experience that helps them overcome the damage, helps them overcome the trauma that they've suffered, and positions us to be, be able to respond. And then we've already talked a little bit about the response vehicle, so I won't take any more time with that. In Texas, and this is a picture of the campsite in Texas, if you will. This is uh, in Ballstrup. This is actually a zone-driven asset. These were all agent tents. And so the local agents within the market area had had this established long before the first loss even occurred. Um, they knew the fire was coming. They knew it was widespread enough that we were going to have losses. And the agents came together and set up a customer response center. So it was then relied to the public affairs who published that. We used our outbound dialer to notify our customers that if you had, in the event you have a loss, here's where you go. At that site, we had uh, local zone employees that were handing out water. They were pro providing advance checks that were confirming coverages that were giving teddy bears to the kids that were helping set up uh, temporary housing arrangements for customers that had confirmed coverage. When we arrived, we brought in the staff that basically did the estimatics. We used the aerial pictometry and some of the total losses we were settling within 24 hours with stick built estimates within uh, with uh, being able to apply uh, handwritten line coded estimates as to what the total repairs would be done. So the customers and the economy had the money flowing a little bit more quickly so that they could actually get back into the homes earlier. And then the advertising at the end of this was really heavily laden with um, mitigation tools, um, kind of helping folks understand that when you actually mow the lawn and you push it out a little bit further out and you, do, you get rid of the debris around the old barn out back, um, that actually can prevent fires as you move through. And some of the post-event strategies have been probably, even though we won't spend a lot of time today talking about them, this is where we really take a step back and, and uh, evaluate everything that has gone on from the start of the spark all the way through the final conclusion when we walk out of town. What are the things that we could have done better? What are the ways that we could have assisted our insureds? How could we have helped the communities prepare greater? Um, it's a pretty much A to Z comparison of everything that goes on. We have about well, 800 different integers that we look at around the relativity of if, if we move this this way, is the response better? If we responded differently here, would we have a different effect and approach? Uh, we then share a lot of that with local communities back through the local folks that are in, on site. And we try to build up that relationship so that from a corporate entity, we're supporting our zone. Uh, associates and their leadership so that they can build better relationships with the uh, local community in the effort of hopefully mitigating and preventing losses in the future. And then um, some of the examples of some things that we have done since some of the fires, actually the wildfire response plan was put in place in these particular counties in Texas and the county uh, officials have all signed off and so there's an incorporated response plan that State Farm and the insurers have all bought into as well as the counties. And so we think that's kind of a unique approach because um, we are in a competitive environment, but this is a sense where all the insurers are pulling together to suggest, hey, this is in the best common good for all if we work together to try to do some things on the mitigation side on the front, front end. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then uh, the, the other one is uh, that's kind of came out of a post-event strategy was that in California following the fire losses, uh, they provide virtual training for our agents and staff around the exposures and how to respond and how to prepare for and how do you help customers who've suffered through wildfires and what are some of the early planning stages that they can step into and, and, and approve and approach. So, um, Across the board, uh, we continue to try to drive that relationship to our consumers or our customers because quite frankly that's who our relationship is with and uh, trying to put them in a better position so that they can respond as well as prevent fires, which in the end will help those communities as we go. Um, be open for questions or a break. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Rob Scott here. Hi, Rob. Um, one of your slides mentioned uh, something about wildfire models. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you can comment on those at all, whether they're internally developed or from one of the major modeling companies, and uh, how they've assisted in assessing risk and how accurate they've been, perhaps? Um, 
I, I, can, I can speak enough to be dangerous about them. I know that they're internally created. Uh, most of our modeling, especially in the pricing elements, are um, created internally. We own the data. We own the, the process. We do rely on externals to help us with a broader macro approach to it. So we'll use some of our reinsurers, uh, some of the relationships we have to help us model that. Um, overall, I would say that the pricing component, because it's so geographically approached, in some markets we're on, some markets we're off. And a model is just really a model that helps you try to assess it. Um, because of the limited experience and the limited exposure relative to what we see with this compared to other larger events, um, you know, the jury's still out, I would say, on whether or not we're appropriately priced for the fire risks. Hello, Gina Ferris. Okay. Um, just a little bit uh, confused as to how an internal sprinkler system can help when the whole house on the outside could be engulfed in flames. So uh, how, how, would, how is that effective? Um, it, it's more on the mitigation piece, I believe. Uh, and, and, and so I would ask the same question because I'm in the community that's going to require these things to be done. Uh, it really is trying to the suppression side if we can get the water into the home uh, that a fire occurs in the home, it will probably not expand beyond the home. And so is it relative to a large wildfire where you have um, a, a, you know, a fire moving through? Probably not because most of the time the, the pressure in the fire is going to be down anyway. But it's more around some of the mitigation efforts to just try to prevent damages to an individual home at the event of a fire. It's a good question, though. If I can just build on that response, part, part of the fire smart dialogue we're talking about how to stop a fire from getting into a community, right. also how to stop someone from having a fire that gets out into the community. So you, you, can, you can imagine a fire that starts in a home in a vulnerable area, and once that first home goes down, could that spread across the whole community? So having an internal sprinkler would reduce the risk that an initial fire will get lost and build into what could become an interface fire, mm -hmm. is one aspect. Yeah, and I, there may have been a misunderstanding as well. Uh, when uh, Mike and I talked about sprinkler systems, we're talking external sprinkler systems, and that's a different strategy, and uh, I don't know if uh, Jamie may touch on that a little bit as well, but that's an emerging technology that I think needs some more attention as well that hopefully we can talk about later today. Uh, Carl, Brian Stocks, um, I just wondered whether You've been at this for a while. State Farm's been at this for a while. Do you have uh, uh, a number of success stories that uh, where you can link uh, insurance and FireSmart together and actually show uh, that that it affects the bottom line for insurance companies and um, also that uh, you've had some success? Uh, do you have examples of that 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 are public knowledge? Uh, you know, to, to pinpoint a specific example, I don't have. I, 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 if I can throw it in some generalities, however, if you look at the California exposures that we had in the early 90s, um, where I would say that the, the fire smarter, fire wise in California at the time was not as advanced as today, whereas we still have the similar fire risks in California. We st still have the similar weather patterns in California, but we have yet to really have that large of a, of a fire event occur over the period of time. So anecdotally, I would say, the efforts of the community, the efforts of the, the state, and, and, uh, and actually the efforts of the individual consumers is having some impact. Um, but I don't have any specific examples relative to say this is point A to point B, and this is what we did to get there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. That was wonderful.